Hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome to another live Facebook or YouTube live with me. I am just going to close this, get a little better light. Oh, that's much better. I am so happy to be here with you today. We're talking about the difference between PMS and PMDD and kind of what you need to know. I'm Elisa Vitti. I'm the founder of Flow Living, and we are the premier destination for natural hormonal support for all of your hormonal imbalances that can happen from your um, cycle, your fertility, and even perimenopause. So I'm happy that you're here. Welcome, welcome. I'm looking forward to diving in. I guess before we get started, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, tell me where you're tuning in from. Tell me if you struggle with PMS or PMDD and start typing in any questions that you have because this is interactive for those of you who are live with me today. Now, we're going to go through everything while you guys are introducing yourselves. Hey, Crystal from Houston. Welcome, welcome. Curious what your PMS or PMDD is like. I'd love to hear some symptoms. I'd love to hear. Uh, hi. <laughs> and just let me know what you're dealing with. Um, hey, Kayla, live from Brooklyn, been managing PMDD for years, managing it well, I hope. And how have you been managing it? What's been your <clears throat> secret to success or what has been working for you? I think, you know, we're here to, to share. Uh, Krista from Ottawa, welcome. Amy, hey from New York. This month was tough. Too much junk food. <laughs> I get it. Emily in Salt Lake City suffering from PMDD. This is a safe space so we can all share with each other kind of what's going on. Um, so interesting fact. <clears throat> hey, Jessica from Orlando, your luteal phase can consist of high emotion, anxiety, and fatigue. I like that. I love that um, emoticon face. That's like <laughs> so adorable. <laughs> you just want to like hug it and make it feel better. Hi from Kuwait. Um, you're fasting during Ramadan. Yes. I, I, is it a Eid now? Or is that at the end? I forget. I forget. But I have a, a dear friend who is also fasting and I think that. I, what I do know from her is that you don't have to fast on your set, your bleed days. You get to have more. And I would just aid at the end. Thank you. That's right. Um, and forgive me for pronouncing it so badly. <laughs> I, I try. I like to learn new, new languages. Um, but I, I do know that you're able to break your fast during your bleed days. And I think if PMS, um, you know, the luteal phase is really so important. In fact, if I, if I could have my, you know, say in the matter, you wouldn't, you would break your fast basically after ovulation. And then when your bleed is ended, then go back to the fast because you really do actually need 279 more calories per day during those 10 days before your period, the luteal phase, just to have a healthy cycle and a normal cycle. So, you know, I don't know how that all works, but it's an individual choice, perhaps, and see how you do. Um, okay, Kayla, uh, mostly a lot of self-awareness, journaling, tracking moods, mm, regulating communication with your partner. Yeah, it can't be, it's, you know, nothing is perfect. I think that's really great that you have a lot of uh, conversation around it. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, overeat, I don't know what your name is, R-A, but meaning if you are, um, if you're not eating all day, then, you know, during the luteal phase, it's going to be so hard to regulate your eating because all day long, your ghrelin is going to be kicking in this neurotransmitter that says eat, 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 but you're not eating. And then at night, you know, after the prescribed time, I know you break the fast and then you have like a certain amount of time to eat, which is later in the evening. It's really not optimal for women's cycles at all, really, the, that part of the fast, that half of the cycle. Um, 
So don't feel guilty taking care of yourself, regardless of where you are in the process is my two cents, because I want to put you first. <laughs> All right, Laura, PMS every month, sore breast, exhaustion, cramps, name a few. All right, well, let's dig in. Now that we're all here, we've introduced each other, and I feel like I'm getting to know you. Okay, Emily, um, ovulation through your period is complete hell. Wow. Okay. Yep. Had to cut out coffee, caffeine, and sugars. Have had some improvement, but PMDD still rages strong. Um, yeah, let's die. let's get into it. I want to get into it with you guys. Let's get into it. It feels like a workout. Let's get into it. <laughs> I always do some sort of movement before I get on these lives. So my brain is awake for all of you. So I want to get into it now on this. All right. So sort of at the highest level, you know, PMDD versus PMS. All right. So PMS is, is very common. Not now, you know, I've talked to you about this before. It doesn't mean that it's normal or that we should tolerate it, but PMS has a variety of symptoms um, and you could have a lot of them. You can have headaches, bloating, cramping, acne, insomnia, breast tenderness, sugar cravings, irritability, mood swings, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, right? And we're going to see a lot of these sound the same. Um, but they start five-ish days before your, the bleed starts. So that's sort of one key distinction. And they pass as soon as the bleed begins, right? The other thing I will say about PMS is that it's very, very responsive to dietary changes very quickly. Okay, so that's PMS. Now let's talk about PMD and we're, we're PMDD, and we're going to kind of go deeper into each for in a minute. PMDD is diagnosed when a woman has five or more symptoms present before, sort of like the ten days, almost right after ovulation, can be the whole luteal phase, and they resolve you know, sometimes after the bleed has kind of already started. These symptoms are not occasionally bothersome. Um, in PMDD, they, they really feel like they kind of stop the train. You know, they interfere with school, with work, with relationships for really a full 50% of the month. And that's really the big difference. You know, PMS is like a few days. You can kind of power through it. PMDD is like a migraine, you know, you've got to put yourself in a room alone and kind of hold on till it's, till it passes. Okay. It's very, it, so really the difference is really in length of time in intensity and how much it's interrupting your existence, right? But some of the symptoms are almost the same, right? Headaches, bloating, cramping, insomnia, acne, breast tenderness, sugar cravings, irritability, mood swings, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances. Here's where it kind of gets a little different. Rage, bouts of rage, more body pain, joint and muscle pain, hot flashes, extreme fatigue, major appetite changes, difficulty concentrating, feelings of hopelessness or overwhelm, um, decreased interest in your usual activities, bouts of extreme sadness, and even suicidal thoughts. So it's a much more extreme form um, of, you know, PMDD. Interestingly enough, um, oftentimes, there women with PMDD can actually be often misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder because the symptoms are so similar. So it's important to sort of track your symptoms when they're happening in the cycle. Um, and it really sort of the key differences have that more PMS vibe to it, right? Versus like hyperactivity, impulsivity, frenzied speaking, which is more in that bipolar disorder symptoms. PMDD, we're talking about like food cravings, binge eating, bloating, headaches, joint and muscle pain. But if you have had, you know, and I know it's very common, women kind of get bounced around trying to get a, an, um, a proper diagnosis. And oftentimes uh, bipolar and PMDD can be mistaken for each other. And I think it's important to take, to have the correct information. So ever important to track your symptoms. Um, and, oh, see Kayla, right. Um, 
I think it's so important to make sure that you're tracking your symptoms and having the right conversation with experienced physicians in PMDD, right? Which, you know, now here's the other thing. PMDD only affects 8% of the population versus PMS, um, you know, affects more like 80% of women, which is terrible, you know. And I kind of want to go through what I think can be really helpful. You know, you know, when you look on the Mayo Clinic, what I what I always really impressed by is the fact that things are changing, right? If you go on the Mayo Clinic and you look up PMDD, they're going to talk to you about studies that have been done on nutritional supplements, herbal remedies, and making dietary and lifestyle changes. That is such exciting thing news to see on on a site like the Mayo Clinic, right? Um, here, I can actually put the link in here for you because we have that ability. Let me, let me just post that link, right? There's a little Mayo Clinic on PMDD, right? And I think that it's fantastic because what that means is that there are things that you can do, right? Now, you'll also see there are things like birth control and um, SSRIs. Those are things we'll talk about in a minute, but mostly I want to kind of talk about what we can do from a functional nutrition point of view to really help ourselves. So let's kind of go into it um, as far as what causes PMS versus what causes PMDD. All right. So again, this is frustrating to share because I feel like we should have the research that gives us these answers, but, but they don't know why somebody experiences PMDD. Medical community does not understand what the cause is. They do have some in, inclination that um, it has to do with, and I, I, I tend to agree with this, that there is some way that when estrogen drops off after ovulation precipitously because you know during ovulation you get this like big surge and then it drops off after the egg is released that affects serotonin levels in the brain you know estrogen and and the brain are very linked in fact in 1996 dr Catherine woolley at northwestern university tracking the estrogen patterns throughout the month really actually was the first to distinguish that the female brain changes up to 25 percent over the course of the month it's thought that women with PMDD have a sensitivity to this serotonin estrogen relationship. That's all that they know. They don't know more than that. I think some studies would easily decide, discern what is exactly happening, um, but funding for women's issues like this are not adequate. And so that is the situation. Um, so there's that. There is also potential underlying hormonal imbalance. Um, there is also um, other health issues that could be sort of part of the process. You know, um, for example, it has it is thought again by the medical community that it, pre-existing mental health issues um, like diagnosed depression or anxiety can predispose you to this or be a part of the story. Um, you know, I'm wary of that because, you know, there's this long history of women being hysteric, being, you know, considered hysterical and, um, the word, uh, hysterical comes from the Greek word hysteros, which means uterus. So like, you know, there's just this sort of like, I don't, it feels a little kludgy, you know, like, oh, if a woman's having health, mental health issues, then, you know, this is a, the sort of source of everything. I don't like that. I think we have um, the right to have much more uh, granularity applied to our um, diagnosis and evaluation. So, you know, if, in, because for example, I'm somebody who had um, lots of depression, lots of overwhelm, lots of um, sleeplessness, lots of, lots of, of these symptoms when I was going through my PCOS, I couldn't get up in the morning. I, I was overwhelmed doing simple tasks. I remember just being overwhelmed by trying to open my mail, um, restoring my hormonal balance, right. Um, resolved all those, those issues. So, you know, I, I think it's really just about how you want to look at your journey to, um, recovery and what you're willing to take and what you're not willing to take, you know, and for me, um, 
I, I felt strongly that I, I wanted to kind of see what my body was capable of if I gave it the right inputs. So um, I think that it's frustrating to, to not be having a clear understanding of where PMDD comes from. But at the same time, if we, if we, kind, if we simply take what we know, right, which there's definitely something going on with underlying hormonal imbalances, there may be going on, something going on with your gut-brain connection, serotonin and estrogen, um, and that you might be just more sensitive um, to all of these things then this is something that we can work with, right? By actually doing some things with diet and supplements. So, you know, and then there's also one factor of the self-care that I think really um, is very similar to what I always recommend for women with PMS. So let's kind of break down what I like to, to suggest here. It is harder to treat than PMS, but I really have seen women really dramatically improve their symptoms with some strategic food and lifestyle intervention. So first thing is, and again, this is all research-based. So um, research suggests that PMDD symptoms may actually become less severe if you eat a high tryptophan diet because tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin. And so what I want you to do is eat a lot of high protein and complex carbohydrates in your diet. And oh, by the way, when do I specifically love to recommend women eating lots of protein and complex carbohydrates. If anybody has read my second book, In the Flow, you know that the luteal phase requires more stable blood sugar and the best way to stabilize that and to give you that serotonin boost when estrogen is, has dropped before it rises again is to eat more protein-rich foods and complex carbohydrates. Um, that's right, Jessica, the luteal phase. So it's perfect for you to, as soon as ovulation has taken place, like just start like having your protein, you know, salmon, wild salmon, pasture, grass-fed poultry, beef, whole grain, organic brown rice, quinoa, beans, chickpeas. Um, it's, it's great. The other thing about eating this way is it's going to support progesterone production, which helps reduce estrogen dominance. And, you know, this is one of the most common imbalances that too much estrogen, not enough progesterone that can trigger PMS symptoms and could be contributing to the PMDD severity. The other thing that I would want you to do after, oh, I would want you to do it every day of the cycle, but um, is to really avoid inflammatory foods, right? So the luteal phase, the time between ovulation and your period is actually associated with increased production of inflammatory molecules in the body. So this is why, for example, I said in In the Flow, like don't go getting your dental work done before your bleed starts because it's they, any there's just more inflammation happening in the body um, during the, that luteal phase. And inflammation is thought to play a role in the development of PD, PMDD. So avoiding gluten, dairy, sugar, refined flour, processed foods, factory-raised meat, which is high in those omega-6 fats, um, coffee, artificial sweeteners, all these things that are processed, right? They're going to aggravate your anxiety issues. They're going to fuel inflammation. They're going to make your symptoms more severe. And listen, it may seem like a little bit like, oh my gosh, this is so much. What am I going to do? Um, go slow, be patient, try to incorporate as much as you can one cycle at a time and build on your the last month's success, right? So let's say last one month you eliminate gluten and dairy, great. And then keep doing that every day and then add into for month two, take out caffeine and artificial sweeteners. And maybe by th the third or fourth month, you've had, you have an expanded list of things that you've um, reduced as far as inflammatory foods and your symptoms are also reduced, right? So go slow, slow and steady wins the race when it comes to making changes, okay? Um, good, Kate. Yes, you know you can't have gluten during luteal phase. If you are, and Kate, let me just go up and scroll up. Do you have PMDD? I didn't see you posting earlier. Okay, yeah. If you have PMDD, Kate, I would suggest, which is what the research shows, you need to avoid those things every day, every day, right? Chris is saying, do we avoid healthy carbs in the follicular phase? No, not at all. You can eat your complex carbs in the follicular phase. You got to pick up in the flow. There's lots of great food charts and recipes in there to help answer those questions. 
Um, but especially during the luteal phase, you've got to eat them. And so my friend in, um, in Kuwait, if you are struggling with um, um, PMS or PMDD, you know, the fasting period is going to be challenging for you because of when you're not eating and then what you are eating. Um, Kate, you cut out coffee last May. Okay. And you do have PMDD. Yeah. So every day that's okay. I do it every day too. I don't have gluten. I don't have dairy. I've been doing that for like 20 something years now or caffeine 20 something years. Look at how bright eyed and bushy tailed I am. Right. So it is totally possible to live this way for a long time. In fact, the longer you do it, the easier it gets. <laughs> that's a secret. Um, so I'm glad, Kate, that you're seeing what your body is showing you, Kate, is, is, you know, sort of like the result of one food experiment. Like, oh, wow, I removed this one input and I'm having a different biological output, right? Less severity in my symptoms. What if you change some more inputs, more dietary inputs, right? Be curious, be curious. And like, I wonder what my body can do for me. Um, and you'll see, she can do a lot for sure. Oh, Savannah, thank you. I uh, put a lot of heart and soul and I rewrote that book three times. <laughs> I always tell my daughter that. I'm like, you know, don't be afraid to work really hard. Don't be afraid to to sit down and roll up your sleeves and get to work. Because I remember mommy rewrote each of these books. I just wasn't done. until I, And I know when I was done writing it and I wasn't done until I was done. I had three times rewriting, re-editing, uh, both Woman Code and In the Flow. <laughs> so they're um, the best that I... That I the best of my ability, right? Thank you. So thank you. Please, please, I love and read all of your um, comments on, on the Amazon page. So if you love the book, Savannah, I would love to read your review. Uh, it means a lot to me to see those. Um, okay, let's keep going. Next thing that you can do is keep your blood sugar stable. Now, this is important for any hormone-related condition, but it's actually especially valuable for PMDD because blood sugar imbalance and unstable insulin levels, insulin helps control blood sugar, actually can fuel inflammation. It can also mess with cortisol. And cortisol is one of those stress hormones, which when it's not in balance, can really agitate what is going on with your mental health, right? So elevated cortisol and adrenaline is going to trigger anxiety when, the, you know, like then you can feel overwhelmed, you can feel flooded, you can feel um, heart racing, all that inflammation is going to contribute to the body pain, the joint pain. Um, really, really, really important to keep your blood sugar stable. It's the first step of the flow protocol that I wrote about years ago in Woman Code because it is the most important thing you can do for any hormonal problem, because it's the most important job the endocrine system has, is to safeguard the transport of glucose to the brain, the heart, and the muscle tissue. If you do anything to mess with that job, your whole endocrine system goes nuts trying to compensate for your goof, right? If you skip meals, if you um, eat too many carbohydrates, not enough carbohydrate, you got to get it just right for you, right? You can now, and now it's so easy. You can buy one of those continuous glucose monitors and put them in your arm, or you can just get a prescription for a finger stick glucose monitor. You can, you can check your glucose, right? Um, how many meals? Uh, oh, okay. So what did I use in place of coffee? And then how many meals and some other tricks on stabilizing blood sugar? What did I use in place of coffee in the beginning? Um, I know a lot of people like chicory. I don't like chicory. I love dandelion. I drink roasted dandelion root tea multiple times a day. I love it, love it, love it. It's so good for the liver. It's so good for so many things. I can't be without my dandelion root. But that's not what I started with. I started with um, kukicha tea, which is a roasted, it's the twigs from which the little green tea leaves uh, bud. They take the the first twig that's connected to those little leaves, snip that off, roast them over low heat till they turn this like wonderful, amazing, nutty brown color. And then you can boil them and make this wonderful, very mineral rich, no caffeine, alkalinizing. How do I spell that? Let me type it out. It's a Japanese word, kukicha. Uh, Eden Organics makes this tea. 
uh, in bag form and in loose form. It's wonderful if you buy the loose form, which is much more economical and better for the planet, and also you have less tea bag chemicals in your tea. Um, you just boil a bunch like you're boiling beans. You just boil a bunch of these twigs in some water. The water will turn this nice dark brown color, which reminds you of coffee. And then you can just store it in the refrigerator like you would extra coffee, like in a mason jar. And then when you want some, you can drink it cold with a little squeeze of lemon in the warm days or in the first half of your cycle. And then in the second half, you can heat it up and put a cinnamon stick. In. You, can go, you can doctor it up however you like. It's wonderful. It's very astringent and nutty um, if you're not ready to move over to dandelion. Uh, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a very picky herbal tea drinker. I don't like hot potpourri types of tea. I like, um, you know, these sort of more astringent things because my liver really likes that. And that's what that's all about, right? So dandelion and, uh, and those types of things. Um, okay, let's talk about how many, oh, but matcha, Kate, matcha has caffeine. So matcha might not work for your PMDD. Okay, so if you have it maybe once in a while, maybe in the first half of your cycle, you can get away with it, but I wouldn't mess with it in the second half of your cycle. It's going to sort of throw you off. Um, how many meals a day to help balance blood sugar? As many as it takes. As many as it takes. I do, There is no dogma for that, right? The, the rule of thumb is that it really depends on how well you're balancing your macros, meaning your macronutrients, so fats, proteins, carbohydrates, uh, fiber. If you, ha if you, and this is why when women start Monthly Flow, which is our premier program to help women balance their hormones, one of the first food activities that they do actually has to help them figure out how to balance these macros properly for each woman, for you individually, so that you know, okay, I need to have this type of combination of foods on my plate, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I need to have this many snacks. You've got to figure that out. And it really is very individual and it depends on where you are in the cycle. But once you get your pattern established, then you can kind of roll with it. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's keep going. Love the chat today. Thank you for being so, um, asking great questions and contributing so many things. That's always more fun. Okay, let's talk. So we've talked about, just to recap, Getting more tryptophan in your diet by incorporating high protein foods and complex carbohydrates. Okay, that's going to help with serotonin production. Okay, second thing is avoiding inflammatory foods. And of course, I would add to this like get rid of chemicals in your life, like makeup, you know, skincare, or cleaning products, like keep, make your home a sanctuary of like no endocrine disruptive chemicals. Balance your blood sugar. Um, oh, one more thing about balancing blood sugar and some of the symptoms of PMDD, right? Anxiety, depression, overwhelm, brain fog, <clears throat> right? These things are also symptoms of um, hypoglycemia, which means blood sugar drops, right? This is why it's so important to figure out how to keep your blood sugar stable because if you go too long without eating, for example, or if you eat something that spikes and then drops your blood sugar, right? For me, I try to think of some things. Um, oh, if I if I were to ever eat like something like a pancake first thing in the morning, forget it. I would be I would be sick, legitimately, like on the couch, not feeling well for hours because my blood sugar would go whoop and then down, and I would be nauseous, headachy, tired, irritable, feeling anxious, my heart could race. All of these things are signs of hypoglycemia. So if that can just happen to anybody, imagine if you're somebody who is predisposed to PMDD or actively struggling with PMDD, and you're not locking in, dialing in your blood sugar management, that hypoglycemia, you're going to feel that, and it's going to exacerbate what you're experiencing with your PMDD. So that that's the bad news. But the good news is you can do everything about that. You can get all over that. You can make sure that that doesn't happen. And the more you keep your blood sugar stable, the more your mood will stay stable. That is just a wonderful thing that you can do for yourself. Um, and, and you don't necessarily need medi a medication to keep your mood stable. You need your blood sugar to be helping you keep your mood stable. 
And that doesn't mean that you don't necessarily need medication. It just means that you want to do all that you can from a functional nutrition point of view to help your body perform at its best so that you can use as little as possible other interventions, right? Okay, moving on to the supplements. So important, okay? And again, the Mayo Clinic is really interested in this as well and all the studies are about this. So we know omega-3s have shown a lot of, a lot of studies on that and depression, uh, anxiety. Um, so it's, it's, there's actually research that does show that omega-3s can reduce some of the psychiatric symptoms of PMS and PMDD. So that includes depression, nervousness, anxiety, lack of concentration, and some of the physical symptoms, bloating, headache, breast tenderness. I think it's so important to take them. Magnesium and vitamin B6. Um, they can help reduce the severity of PMS. And because women with PMS and PMDD share very similar underlying hormonal imbalances, I think it can be really compelling to take magnesium and vitamin B6. B6 helps with progesterone production, which all of us can be really um, low in uh, because of the prevalence of estrogen dominance, which you, you know, may be struggling with. And then magnesium, keep in mind, it's, it is um, required, required in over 300 catalytic reactions in the body. Magnesium. You don't want to be depleted in magnesium. I take it every day. It is non, there are certain micronutrients that are non-negotiable. If somebody has a question, Kayla, do I have a, an omega-3 supplement that I recommend? You bet. I'm super, super picky. I formulated my own. The big bottle here, that's the omega-3. Then there's the B vitamins. Then there's the liver support. Then there's the probiotic um, and the magnesium. The non-negotiable supplements, these are called the balanced supplements. You can get them on my website, flowliving.com. They are, every woman needs them. If you've been on birth control, um, no, you, they come in a kit because you need all of them. So they're all, they come all together because I didn't want you to just have one and not get all the results that I know are possible when you give your body therapeutic doses, not something you can get in a gummy. Somebody asked about gummies. I think earlier, maybe, let me look, maybe not, maybe I'm imagining that. Um, gummies don't contain therapeutic doses, just impossible to manufacture therapeutic doses of, of micronutrients into a gummy format, which is why we don't have gummies. So this, however, these are therapeutically dosed. The women have been using them now since 2017 and having enormous results, getting pregnant after months of not being able to conceive, getting rid of PMS, I mean, just clearing acne, because your, your body is chronically depleted of these key micronutrients that it cannot function properly without. I cannot stress it enough. This is like the bare minimum you must have every day. So if you haven't picked them up, please, this is why I made them. I want you to have them. Um, okay, let's see. Calcium. Calcium has actually, there's that accidental research that came out that said, oh, 1200 milligrams a day of calcium can actually ease PMDD symptoms. So this would be something you would, you would get outside of the flow um, balance supplements. But a good calcium supplement, 1200 milligrams a day, but split it up into three doses so that your body can absorb it can really ease PMDD symptoms. And so you don't have to necessarily take it every day. You could just take it in the luteal phase and see how that helps you. Uh, Vitex or chaste berry um, can help with the physical symptoms of PMDD like breast tenderness, bloating, and cramps. So that's a really great one. I love um, Gaia herbals for their Vitex. I'll write it here for you, Gaia herbals. Um, best, best in class. Um, and then L-tryptophan, right? So that's the, uh, that's the um, amino acid that we were talking about before. When you eat a high-protein diet, you can also supplement with L-tryptophan, which is, you know, sort of an isolated form of that amino acid can. Again, you could try playing with taking that supplement just during the phase when your symptoms are flaring because it has, there's research that shows promise in reducing PMDD 
symptoms. Some two other things that I think are really important, okay? You've got to prioritize stress reduction, okay? So what does that mean? You know, listen, I, right, and, and Jen, calcium competes for magnesium. So that's exactly right. You want to make sure you're taking both, which it's in, the, it's in our balance formulation. So you'd be covered if you just took an extra, um, if you took calcium on the side. Um, I love I love all my smart ladies here. It's wonderful. Okay, so what you want to do is figure out a way that you can stress reduce that that feels not like something else to your to do list because that is not going to reduce your stress. Here are my favorite uh, couple things. Okay, that actually flush cortisol because when we're talking about stress reduction, I really want to help you flush cortisol. Um, and really move that that hormone out of your body. So there are two things that move the needle measurably in terms of cortisol reduction. The first is uh, jumping on a like a small trampoline, like a mini rebounder. Okay, you can find those on Amazon. Um, is super super important. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to do a workout. Just a couple minutes throughout the day. Like say you just had a stressful call. After the call, just get on the rebounder and just bounce for like a minute or two. Low low impact bouncing. You're not like up and down. Just a little, little bouncing. That's the first thing. Second thing, uh, and you, some of you may have joined us for this uh, challenge in February. We did this free biohacking your orgasm challenge in February because self-pleasure and actually having orgasm, not climax, um, and I write about this in the, in, in the flow, is so like the most powerful thing you can do for uh, flushing cortisol and, and managing your stress. You know, try those things because some of the other things like sitting or, I don't know, dancing or any, anything that it can feel when you're not in a good mood. And I, you know, I, rem I remember feeling just depressed and anxious all the time. Like it's hard to have a dance break. It's hard to um, meditate. You know, it just doesn't, like you just can't do it. You know, <laughs> it's just hard to do those things when you're not feeling there to do it. So I understand I have been there, but just like, Getting on the trampoline, it's like a nothing thing. You just stand on it. You almost don't have to move. You can just kind of like bounce. And before you know it, like it has a really quick physiological impact and it's pretty effective. And then self-pleasuring too, you know, it may be hard to generate uh, feelings of, of desire or have any sort of sense of libido when PMDD is raging. But you know, this is when using a vibrator on the lowest possible setting would be advisable just to help your body have some of this cortisol release via the orgasmic process. So I think it's really, really important to try those two things. I, I think they are overlooked, very powerful biohacking tools for women and especially for this condition. Um, so, so important. Okay. So don't, I, don't try to do all the other like wellness things. Just do the things that are going to work. <laughs> um, okay. Right, Jen. Exactly. Right. And this is when like self-pleasuring would be good. Like, you know what? Just, oh, there was a new, oh, there's a new website. I haven't listened. I haven't checked it out, but I just heard about it. And I'm so happy to share because when I see something good, I like to share. I think this is the right, I think it's called that, Dipsy, I think. You, here's what it's supposed to be when you get there. It's supposed to be um, audio stories that are erotic in nature. So you could like listen to them, relax on your couch kind of see if, you know, you have like a little Bridgerton moment and then you could do a little self-pleasuring, right? With or without a vibrator. And the goal is not necessarily to climax. The goal is to just have pleasurable sensation and, um, you know, and then you'll, you'll flush your cortisol and then you can get back to your day, right? And you can do this as often as you would like. There is no, um, 
limit of how often you can self-pleasure when you're feeling like you need that support throughout the, the luteal phase when PMDD is problematic for you. Because orgasm boosts your mood, orgasm boosts serotonin, orgasm reduces inflammation, orgasm not climax. If you don't know the difference, please pick up in the flow and I'll, it, it's all explained there. Um, and these are all things that you need when you're dealing with PMDD, okay? So, you know, I'm always giving the best homework, like eat chocolate and self-pleasure. I don't know. <laughs> the good news is, is that it actually works as well as it being fun and, and, and sounding easy. All right, and then the last thing I wanna say is that if you haven't yet discovered this method that I created called the cycle syncing method, um, I want you to start incorporating that because within the cycle syncing method, which is all outlined in in the flow, right? The whole idea is that you have different, you have four distinct hormonal phases during the cycle. You have four distinct hormonal ratios throughout the cycle. They're affecting you in distinct ways. We need to eat and exercise and do our self care to match what is happening biologically. You're not supposed to eat the same calories every day. You're not supposed to do the same intensity workout every day. All of that is research that was done on men that optimizes their mental health and hormonal health and physical health, but it disrupts our mental health, hormonal health, and physical health. So I think another overlooked root cause of PMDD and PMS is this sort of... Um, cyclical disruption that takes place when we don't know about our infradian rhythm, which is the, the biological clock that we have in addition to the circadian clock that men don't have that governs our hormonal patterns. So when we disrupt this infradian rhythm, it has major effects on our brain, on our hormones, on our immune system, and our weight in every capacity, right? Fertility, sex drive. So Start using the cycle syncing method. You can download the app that I built called myflowtracker.com. Okay. Um, this is a very special app. It's the only official cycle syncing method app. It's going to tell you what to eat, what to do in each phase of the cycle. It's going to help you track your symptom burden and symptom severity. It's going to be your best companion um, to helping you with utilizing the cycle syncing method. Um, and then of course you can also join us in the cycle syncing membership, uh, which I am typing out here for you. So you can get workout videos, recipes, grocery lists, everything. So you don't have to like figure this out on your own. That, that's why I've built this company. So I've done all these things for you. So you can just grab the resources that you need. Okay. And then as far as the supplements go, let me put the link in here for you too, in case you are needing them, because if you're struggling with PMDD, the reality is that there's some micronutrient deficiency that you've got to address according to the research and the Mayo Clinic, you know, kind of backs this up, right? So it's important for you to get on top of what your body needs. And this is one of the ways that you can do that. So let's recap tryptophan, high protein, complex carbohydrates, take out anything inflammatory, all right, foods, chemicals, stuff like that. Balance your blood sugar. Adopt a smart supplement strategy. Pick up the uh, flow balance supplements. You can add in some calcium. You can add an extra L-tryptophan if you wanted. Try measurable cortisol reducing strategies like urban rebounding or mini rebounding and uh, self-pleasure and start cycle syncing because it is absolutely going to be your best ally and method and tool and lifestyle to help you really optimize and care for each phase of your cycle. And you know, we've had so many women with PMDD using our supplements, using the cycle syncing method who really get their lives back because, you know, even it's not necessarily about having every single symptom go away, right? It's having the symptoms be reduced such that it's not stopping you. Like we talked about at the beginning when I was describing the sort of scenario where you have to like close yourself off in a room and wait till it passes where you can actually function like you would want to. And that's what I want for you. I want you to be able to 
feel the way you want to feel and be the, the, the woman that you want to be in your life, right? And, and I know that that having had those issues where I felt like I couldn't be in, the, in my life the way I wanted to because of my hormonal imbalances and their impact on my mental health, um, I know what it feels like to have that lifted and to kind of get back to the life that you have in mind for yourself. So the, I'm sorry that you're struggling with these hormonal symptoms. It wasn't fun for me. I know it's not fun for you. But I hope that I've provided you with some great news today, which is that um, even mainstream medical, you know, conventional medicine is very much in support of women with PMDD using dietary and supplement therapeutics to help their reduce their symptom severity. And then I also hope that I've given you a very clear plan of those changes to make with diet and supplements to help move the needle. That's not too overwhelming, but that gives you the right framework. And ultimately, I hope that I've provided you with some easy tools, the book, the supplements, the app, the membership to help you start making these changes as easily as possible so that you don't feel like you're on your own having to figure this out and do it all by yourself. You're not alone. The Flow Living community is a sisterhood of women who have hormonal issues, who are working on resolving them. So be part of our community because that's what we're all up to and we're all here to help each other. So on that note, I hope that this was super helpful. If it was, um, share, share with your friends. You can share this video. You can share flowliving.com. Um, let them know that there are some resources and that there is a company that cares about their hormones. That's, that is why I do what I do. Um, and uh, yes, I read all your comments. So you can post on Facebook. You can shout us out on Instagram. We're at Flow Living and at Aliza.vd. If you've read the books, please leave a, a, a five-star review on Amazon. I read them all. I look forward to them. And thank you so much for joining me today. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another great topic. And until then, take really good care of your hormones. And I'll talk to you soon.